So thanks for the introduction. Um, I was actually standing here at a contributor summit at some point in the past talking about the same topic. So uh, what's new is that we finally released this stuff as a tech preview in 5.10. So we actually would like to encourage people to start trying it out while it is a tech preview so we can find out what everything we did wrong and make corrections <laughs> before it becomes a permanent part of Kit Quick. So yeah, if you don't know about me, I've, um, I wrote my first Qt application in 2004 and worked for, I'd written Qt applications at a couple other companies and then I got hired in, at, the, at uh, Nokia in Oslo and it's of course turned into the Qt company. So I've been there since 2011 and I've mostly always been interested in the input devices, especially touch and Wacom tablets because the support for them always seemed a bit lacking to me. And I've also worked on the Linux and Mac OS QPA plugins a little bit. Uh, the Q PDF module, I'm not the only one on that, but I've done some work. And a little bit on controls and dialogues. Um, so today we'll talk about uh, touch handlers, or yeah, pointer handlers, which includes mouse, touch, and eventually tablet support. First I'll talk about the existing stuff that was there before, mouse area and so forth and some goals, things that we wanted to try to fix. We'll have an introduction, um, then I'll go through a bunch of scenarios, how you use the pointer handlers for different kinds of interaction scenarios. A uh, little comparison, uh, the new versus the old way of doing things, and new concepts and so forth, and about also what's left to do. Okay, so event delivery, as we've known it so far in Qt Quick, um, when you do a press, that's when most of the work happens initially that we have to um, go through the children of the QQuick window in reverse paint order. And meaning that, you know, normally you would render, if you're doing rendering, you'd render the bottom item first and then you'd render something on top of it and so forth. But with pointer delivery, we go the opposite direction. We want to deliver the event, the mouse event, the mouse press, for example, to the item on top first and ask if it's interested and then if it, um, if it rejects the event, because I mean we, we have this assumption that it's going to be accepted by default when it goes to that first item. So if it fails, if it, um, if it rejects or ignores the event, then we'll go to the next item underneath and so forth until one of them fails to ignore, which means that they accept. And then we assume that there's a grab from that point on because we don't want to repeat this delivery for every update. So we just assume that the item which was at first interested is going to continue to be interested. And so it receives all the updates and also the release. And for the most part, no other item has a chance after that. So we call that an, ex an exclusive grab. The only exception is, well, what about Flickable? If you have a button on a Flickable or inside a Flickable and you start by pressing the button, um, the button has a mouse area and the mouse area is going to accept the event or it's going to fail to ignore it, which means that it accepted it by default. And that means it has the grab. And then when I start moving, how does Flickable start taking over? Um, it sets filters child mouse events. It's a parent. And so there's this little detour that we take during delivery where before we deliver either a press or an update or uh, to, the, to the mouse area, we go to its parent and its parent and its parent and so forth and we check each, each parent which has set this filters child mouse event bit. If that bit is set, then we call it child mouse event filter. And that'll return true if it wants to intercept the event, meaning that it wants to take over. And that basically is called stealing the grab. So the flickable takes the grab away from the mouse area and says, well, I'm doing flicking now because you've dragged past the drag threshold. And then the mouse area gets a cancel and so you see the feedback that your button isn't pressed anymore. So this is a little bit limiting because um, there are a lot of cases where you maybe want to have multiple items monitoring the mouse all the time. Um, so we've come up with this concept of passive grab now, which I think maybe exists in other frameworks and windowing systems and so forth. They have this idea too. Um, so during the initial press delivery, it's possible for pointer handlers, which are these new things we're going to be talking about, they're, they're not items, but um, we'll be delivering to the pointer handlers and multiple pointer handlers can take passive grabs without stopping propagation. 
And then the result is that multiple pointer handlers can monitor all the time. So I'm going to show, you see three sprites moving around here. That's my three fingers on the touch screen. So I have these three point handlers. And as soon as I press, each of them gets a passive crab. And they'll be able to monitor what's going on on the touch screen, regardless of what else is going on. I'll explain a bit more about that, um, how that's implemented later on. So let's talk about mouse area first. We already talked about that um, it becomes the exclusive grabber and um, it has to be stolen from in order, to, in order for something else to, to take over the grab. Uh, well, another thing is that it's called mouse area for a reason. It only handles mouse events. So how do we handle touch? Well, we basically assume that um, um, a touch point can be, can be used to synthesize a mouse event. And so the consequence of that is, since there's only one mouse in the system, or Qt thinks there's only one mouse, even if there actually is more, um, we only track one mouse, and you can't, so you can't press multiple mice, you can't have multiple mouse cursors at the same time, and so you can't actually press multiple mouse areas at the same time. So for mouse area, we don't have multi-touch, actually. And yeah, there's this clumsiness with, uh, if, it if it accepts the event, which it does by default, then that means it has the grab, and so if, you, if a mouse area wants to prevent a parent from stealing, then it can set this prevent stealing property. So that's just a mouse area, a specific thing for a mouse area interacting with Flickable, basically, and not for much else. And well, another thing is that mouse area is kind of a, has a big memory footprint because it's an item. And that means that it, um, it has to, you have to set the bounds. You typically have to use anchors to do anchors fill parent so that the mouse area responds to the same events within the same area that the visual item does. So mouse area is an item, but it's not a visual item. It has nothing to draw, but it has all this overhead as if it did have something to draw. And also it's just a lot of C++ code, and I found out the hard way if I tried to, I wanted to make a mouse area handle touch events, uh, because I thought, well, we have to, we have, to have multi-touch. We say that we do, and the synthesis is nonsense. So <laughs> can I make mouse area handle touch events? Well. Uh, that was hard because if because Flickable and Mouse Area cooperate so closely, then that meant that I had to do a lot of work in Flickable as well, and it ended up being a lot of duplicate code. I had patches for that, and I could never get all the tests to pass, and and wasn't able to convince people that we could do this sort of thing without breaking backwards compatibility. And it's a lot of C++ code. It's complicated. It's hard to understand. It um, it does everything you could possibly do with a mouse all in one class which is typically you know, considered bad design or something, right? You, you, you need to modularize your code a bit more than that. OK, but suppose you really want to be able to press multiple buttons at the same time. Instead of mouse area, you, you could use multi-point touch area. And um, so this block down here basically is emulating a mouse area. It fills its parent. It has one touch point inside. The, the reason we have to declare the touch point is to give it an ID. Because then up here we can use it. We can say if touch one is pressed, then that's kind of like mouse area being pressed. So basically I'm impl implementing a button here. I have a rectangle. I have an alias to keep track of whether it's pressed. And I also have a signal which I can emit when it's tapped. So I detect that the pressed state changed. And if it's not pressed anymore, well, it must have been tapped. So then I emit this tap signal. So this is sort of a clumsy way of getting multi-touch buttons so that you can press multiple buttons at the same time. So the downside is the clumsiness and also that there's two, there's at least two Q objects here. If you use anchors, I guess there's another one. But you've got the multi-point touch area, it's an item, and then the touch point is a Q object. So this kind of heavy weight. And anyway, that's not what it was written for. It's a good use for it, but um, it was actually written to do custom gesture recognition. And I've tried to do that before. I don't know if any of you guys have, but uh, it seemed to me that the you have to write a lot of Java. You have to write a lot of JavaScript in order to get anything done. Recognizing a custom gesture, you might have to keep some state. You you, be, you basically write a state machine in Java, and uh, in JavaScript rather, and you uh, you have to store some state to remember what you were doing, and then make the state transitions and so forth. And maybe eventually you can recognize a custom gesture. But I thought maybe it'd be nice to do that in C plus plus instead. Um, so goals for pointer handlers. A lot of times, like if you're building a button, you don't really care 
whether the tap occurs on a touch screen or whether you're mouse clicking or you're using a stylus on your Wacom tablet just because you happen to have the stylus in your hand, you just want to click the button, right? So mouse area wasn't able to be extended, but we want to have something like mouse area which handles devices agnostically. We don't care which device it came from. But then there are other cases where you might want the interaction to be different. Tapping on a touch screen maybe it should do something different than it does with a mouse, depending on your UI. We want to simplify the code delivery path in QQuick Window because uh, since touch and mouse events are quite different from each other, we had to have duplicate code paths before. So basically we created these wrapper events, which I'll get to later on, the pointer events, and those can be delivered uniformly. So we have a more unified code path now in QQuick Window. We already started that in 5.8 and 5.9, and now it's even more in 5.10 that's that way. Uh, so we want pointer handlers to have both QML and C++ APIs. In 5.10, it's only the QML API. And if we don't make major changes, then we just need to do a little bit of refactoring so that we can have public C++ API. Maybe we'll get there in 5.11. So you can do your custom recognizers. And um, just an extra little fringe benefit is that uh, touch event has, each touch point has velocity, but usually it was zero because uh, that was only for QPA um, plugins reading from devices that already knew the velocity. Most devices don't know, or the drivers don't calculate the velocity, so it was usually zero. So that was kind of a useless property, and we decided let's make it useful, and let's further guarantee that the, the pointer events, they have velocity for each point, and they always have velocity. So we calculated ourselves now. So you can tell how fast your mouse is moving in which direction, in case you care about that. Maybe the gesture uh, should be, should pay attention to the velocity so that you can open a sidebar only if you flick sideways at a certain speed or something like that, right? Forward-looking goals, things we haven't gotten done yet. Um, I think we should have support for Wacom tablets in QuickQuick. So far we've never even tried to deliver the events because they're different events and that would be another path. So we've unified that now. So we have these wrapper pointer events that can deliver Wacom events as well. And now we have the path, uh, the shape feature in QuickQuick that's also new in 5.10. So you can have um, arbitrary, you can basically render Q painter paths in QML, although the painter path isn't actually exposed. But you can create an SVG path, for example. I'll show you that later on. So maybe we can come up with, come up with some way later on in 5.11 to actually be able to draw these shapes with your stylus. And yeah, we think that the mouse area, with all of its limitations, Maybe it's going to be obsolete eventually, depending on whether we satisfy ourselves with the pointer handlers to that point that we think we can replace it. So we're hoping that the pointer handlers, by the time we get through the tech preview phase, maybe they'll be able to stay the same uh, for a long time and they'll be the primary way of handling input events in Qt6. Well, there, there's the single mouse limitation that I mentioned earlier. So I haven't really tried very hard yet, but I kind of think that maybe we should remove that limitation at some point because there is multi-pointer X and there's, uh, in Wayland, there's this concept of multiple users, which they, they call seats. So each user might have a separate mouse, a separate keyboard and so forth, and they could interact with the same application at the same time. Um, and I'd like to get rid of the synthesis because it makes a mess in the QQuick window implementation that we have to first, for every item that we visit, first we give it a touch event if it came from a touch device. If it didn't accept that, then we give it a synthesized mouse event which has to be built on the fly. And then we visit the next item and we do the same thing and it's just, it just makes uh, delivery kind of complicated. And it's only there because mouse area doesn't handle touch basically. Okay, so handler objects. Uh, a couple different people independently had this idea and approached me about it. They said, uh, what if we make input handling or mouse handling more like the keys attached property? So you, if you've done keyboard handling before, you know that you can do this as a one-liner. In the simple cases, you want to handle the left arrow, you just do keys on left pressed and write some code to do whatever you want. Well, there's no on A pressed. Let's say we want to handle control A. We want to select everything whatever everything means in your, <laughs> in your model. Uh, there's no on A pressed, so you typically end up having to write keys on pressed and then a switch to decide what to do with the key. Then also check whether the control key is held at the same time and stuff like that. So um, there's a lot of signals 
there are a lot of signals already, but not enough signals not to handle every key on your keyboard. So what should we do? Should we keep adding more and more signals? Um, for all the keyboards, uh, all the keys on all the keyboards in the world, they should have their own signal? I don't know. But the way it is now, you typically have to write a lot of JavaScript. And another disadvantage of attached properties is that you can only have one instance per item. You can only attach one attached object per item of a particular type. So, well, with handlers, it'd be kind of nice if we could make multiple instances for different cases. So that's kind of, that's what I implemented so far. We have child objects, but they're not items, so they're a little bit lighter weight. So if I want to build a button, I can have a rectangle, put a tap handler inside, and then I can watch whether the tap handler is pressed and do feedback. Or I can react on tapped and do some, have a JavaScript callback there. Um, if I want to be device specific, I want to do something only on the touch screen, not with a the mouse, then I can declaratively specify which devices this event will be accepted from. So I don't have to check that in JavaScript. If I want to do dragging and I don't care which device, um, then it's really simple. Declare a drag handler inside your item and you can drag it. Same thing with pinch, to handle the pinch gesture. So we tried to um, have declarative handlers, independent handlers for each gesture. And easy stuff is really easy. There's just one thing to declare. Since the, the unfortunately they're Q objects because we can't, we don't really have any objects which are lighter than Q object for <laughs> in QML, you can't instantiate a, a gadget, for example, a Q gadget. Um, so a Q object is as light as we can go as long as it's going to be a separate object. And it's a lot, it has a lot less storage, a lot less uh, variables than item, Q quick item. And attached properties have their own overheads. I mean, the act of doing the attachment causes an extra object to be created. So it seems like we've made this about as light as we can. Um, every handler has a target property. The default target is the parent. Not really a parent because it's not a, but okay. It can have a parent, but it can't have items as its children. So it's a little bit um, non-uniform or not fully normalized, I guess you might say. But the default target is the item within which it was declared and it will react to the same bounds. So this means that the handler doesn't have to store a rectangle because it's just, you know, using the bounds of its parent and reacting to points inside there. And it's okay to create as many of these as you want for different gestures. So if you have a one tap handler that handles right clicked and another that handles left clicked, that's okay. I'll show that later on. And we actually have multi-touch support now. So the tap handler, for example, you can press two buttons at the same time. I'll demonstrate that pretty soon. We have this um, device type filtering I already mentioned. There's also pointer type filtering, which would be so that you can potentially handle the eraser on your Wacom stylus differently than the stylus itself or the airbrush or whatever. Finger is also a pointer type, so you can, there are two different ways to differentiate touch from mouse. You can either use device type or pointer type. Um, you can filter by button, so it make, an, make a handler react only to the right click or something like that. You can make it react only if a particular key is held at the same time. So this is all declarative. You don't have to do it in JavaScript. You can just say this handler reacts only under these conditions. We don't have the public C++ API yet, but we plan to, so you should be able to make subclasses for uh, the gestures that we don't already support. And yeah, we couldn't change mouse area, so we basically had to do something different. And this way we can leave mouse area exactly as it is and not risk any of the code out there that's using it. Okay, so finally for some examples. Um, here's an example of a drag handler. So I have this ball image and then I put a drag handler inside there. And I said you can just declare the drag handler and you're done, but I added this one extra thing to, to um, do an animation on release. So I can press and drag, and when I release, it has momentum, it keeps going. And the same thing I can do with two fingers. And I, I can sort of fling them across the screen, and if I fling too hard, it goes off the screen, because I don't have any uh, physics to make it bounce back. So it's a very simple declaration to make this ball draggable, basically. And then the momentum animation, that's pure QML right now, but I think maybe we should at some point make a C++ implementation of that to give things momentum because that's a nice way uh, 
simple declaration which does that. Um, okay, next thing is let's use drag handler again, but this time we want to limit the movement so it doesn't go off the screen or outside bounds. So when I come over to the edge, my finger goes further, but the ball stops at the edge. So this is kind of like a joystick, right? If you wanted to implement a, a control like that. So I've got an image, a drag handler inside. Its default target is the image, so that's what it's dragging. And the x-axis and y-axis, I set these constraints. I give a minimum and maximum x and y coordinate. So the x is not allowed to be less than 50 because that was my margin up here I declared. And the same thing on the right. It'll stay at least 50 pixels away from the edge. And then the rest of this is just um, anchors to make it go back to the center and a state change so that when, it's, uh, when the drag handler is active, then th there are no anchors and so it's free to move and as soon as I release, the anchors take it back to the middle and there's a, there's a transition animation to make it bounce a little bit as if it was spring-loaded. Um, okay, so we have a drag handler and then I get to thinking, well, um, Flickable, that's another big monolithic block of C++, C++ code and it does everything. It handles the events, it does the physics, it handles this bounce when you get to the end and it has to sort of go back into range and a lot of stuff like that. But, but what is Flickable under, no, the, the concept of flicking can be implemented with just uh, two items. You've got a, an outer item which is like a viewport and then you have an inner item which is the content. And so, so I, I made something like Flickable here where I've got this, here's the outer item, here's the inner item, a drag handler. So now I can drag the content because it has a drag handler, right? And then the rest of this, well, there's just some little bit of extra Java code to handle the returning to bounds and the animations and so forth. So yeah, it's got a momentum animation, the same one that I used on the ball. So when I stop dragging, it just keeps going until the speed runs out. And um, if I go past the end, then it, it does this return to bounds thing. So basically, it's not all that much QML code to get most of the functionality applicable, which has me thinking um, maybe we should actually refactor Flickable so that it's built from these components and it's just a kind of shorthand. When you create a Flickable, you create this set of objects and that would simplify our code base a little bit. But at any rate, it's an example to show you how you can recreate something similar in case you want to customize it and Flickable isn't quite cutting it for you. You can do something similar but different if you want. So this is the implementation of the Flickable. I'm not, and then um, this code over here is where I'm using it. I instantiate a fake Flickable and put text inside and then I have some JavaScript to actually load because we don't have file loading, right? So do this HTTP request to load a file from the file system basically. Um, and then scroll bars. Then I tie, I have enough uh, aliases to be able to drive the scroll bars. So if I, as I flick, the scroll bar moves and I can also drag the scroll bar to, if I get my finger or the mouse on it, I can drag the scroll bar and, yeah. So it does all the usual stuff. Okay, next one we can talk about is tap handler, which of course is pretty simple because it's just for tapping buttons and things like that. So by default, um, accepted buttons is going to be left, so I can left click. And well, I work together the states of those check buttons down there to get the allowed buttons property. So if I turn on the right click, then that changes and now I can right click as well. Um, the other extra thing it handles is long press. So I set the long press threshold to half a second and down here I have this um, circle, expanding circle feedback, which um, as long as the handler is pressed, the, every time, every frame, there's this time held property which tells how long you've been holding it since the press. So I can actually use that to drive an animation. A little circle expands as long as I'm holding it and then after half a second, then I get this uh, long pressed signal and I just use that to drive an animation. Um, so we have multiple clicks as well because there's a, there's a tap count. So uh, I can handle as many taps as I want. I mean, if you double click, well, there's two. So, so I have this tap counter down here, which, uh, which just shows how many times it's tapped. Okay, next thing is um, 
Well, have you ever, um, you pop up a dialogue sometimes and there's a button on there, like let's say, let's say you decide to press the cancel button and then you change your mind. Oh, I didn't mean to cancel. So you drag outside and you release and it's as if you never pressed the button. It actually, the dialogue stays open and you saved you know, your situation, right? <laughs> so, uh, um, well, then suppose you made the double mistake or you, you know, dragged outside and you say, oh, no, actually I did want to press that button. You've, you're still holding your mouse button. You drag inside, you release, and now it's a, it's, a, it's a click, right? So this is the default policy for the tap handler as well. We have this gesture policy. If you release within bounds, it's still going to be a, it's still going to be a tap. Um, so I can do that. I can, if I drag back out and back in and release, then I still get this tap feedback as long as I do it fast enough so that it's not a long press. Okay, but, there, but then there are other interaction cases where maybe you want to, as soon as I drag outside the bounds, I cancel the tap. So it's not going to tap if I drag out and back in again. There's drag threshold, so as soon as I drag just a little bit, it cancels the tap. So then we'll get this uh, canceled um, signal. That's not working for some reason. That's a bug. I have to fix it. It's supposed to show an animation there on cancel. Um, so the gesture policy, we'll get to that later. It's especially useful if you combine tap handler and drag handler for some reason. Then you've got two handlers that have to work together cooperatively because <coughs> if, you, if you tap without dragging, then it's a tap. And if you start to drag a little bit, then the drag handler can take over and you can actually drag the same object. Okay, um, so here we have this uh, accepted buttons thing, but we only have one tap handler, so you would have a hard time distinguishing which button is pressed. You'd have to do it in JavaScript. Say we want to do this declaratively. Like I said, it's, it's okay to have different multiple instances. So here we've done that. So if I left click, I get a green flash on the border. If I turn on the right accepted button, now I've enabled this tap handler down here and I'm going to get a magenta click if I right click or a magenta flash if I right click and turn on the middle then I can middle click and get an orange feedback. So we've got uh, three different tap handler instances inside the same rectangle. They're all acting on the same bounds but they have different constraints for the buttons that they accept. So that's one way that you can use multiple instances to do different things depending on yeah, the situation. Okay, so that was uh, two handlers so far. We've only got three of these handlers, by the way. Uh, that's one of the reasons why <laughs> it's not quite done yet. It's tech preview, and we expect that there, will, there always will be things that we didn't think of that you'll need the C++ API for. So the third handler that we've got that we're shipping in 5.10 is the pinch handler, which, as it sounds, it handles the pinch gesture. So I can, you know, resize, rotate, and drag this rectangle around simply because I've declared a pinch handler inside. And I also set minimum and maximum rotations and scale so I can't pinch it down too small because then it would be hard to grab. Okay, but there's also this point distance threshold. That's like a margin. So now it actually is pretty small. I can get both of my fingers in there, but let's say it was even smaller. I can't do that anymore. It doesn't matter. I can now uh, stay within 150 pixels of the margin of the edge of the shape and I can still pinch because this is set to 150 here. Okay, and then there was this uh, feature in Ubuntu a few years ago. They, I noticed that they started using three-finger pinch for window management and I thought, man, that's a cool feature. That's something we can't do. So I made this, the pinch handler work with, uh, you can specify how many fingers you want to require. So there's a minimum point count here. This bottom pinch handler, if I do with two fingers, it does nothing. With three fingers, then I can pinch. And it's just using the, the centroid between however many fingers it is as the center of rotation and zooming and so forth. So there's a minimum point count and a maximum point count. And here I have two rectangles, but you can actually do this inside one rectangle. You can have multiple pinch handlers. And so, yeah, you can use this in a... It's a trick I'm going to use in my Wayland compositor, I think, so I can have this... Uh, three-finger pinch to do the window management like Ubuntu was doing a few years ago. And then inside the window, the two-finger pinches will still get through so that the application can see them. Um, so to show the 
how useful it is. I'm going to zoom into Australia right now. This is something you couldn't do with a pinch area. Uh, I put my two fingers there on each side of it, and the centroid is where it zooms into. Then when I release, notice that the map got a little bit sharper. Okay, so now I'll explain how that works. So we have our map here, and then we have a pinch handler, which within the entire bounds of the outer item, the 640 by 480, we have a pinch handler. So I can even do a pinch up here, outside the map, but we've set the target in this case. So we're handling the gesture within the bounds of the outer item, because that's its parent, but we set the target to the map, so it's resizing the map. And then it's the same with it. I put a drag handler here too, just so I can drag around with one finger. So it's the same there. So I can zoom in with two fingers, rotate, and also move, just because we haven't disabled that. And then I can also drag with one finger. And then there's this uh, re-render if necessary. So when the, with, all, with all of the handlers, we have this uh, property active, which says it's active when it's actually doing something. It's recognized whatever gesture it's trying to recognize. So when it's changed, um, if it's not active anymore, then I re-render the map with the appropriate resolution. So this is an SVG file, and I just set the source image source size to control the, the, the actual rendered image. So this isn't the way you normally do maps. You normally have tiles, and you know you get different tiles when you zoom in. But just for an example, I just make my laptop work really hard and generate a <laughs> large rendered version of the SVG when I zoom in. So um, yeah, there's another talk tomorrow afternoon about cute location that they'll talk more about how the tiling works and things like that. And our target for, we hope for 5.11 or, you know, before we come out of tech preview, we want to make sure that the handlers actually handle all the use cases that cute location actually needs because they've got a bunch of C++ custom event handling now too. So when it works for maps, then we can say it's a little bit closer to being done. <laughs> So again, two handlers interacting here on the same object. Um, here's another case, use case for using drag and tap together. Um, so I have sliders, I can drag them as usual. And again, I'm changing the, the target bounds so that this outer, this is the implementation of one slider that I'm showing here, even though there are two on the screen. And uh, so as the drag handler is inside the outer item. So any, anywhere in here on the slot, I can start dragging and then the knob will catch up because I set the target to the knob, but it's handling events within the outer space. Um, then the tap handler, I've got one of those in, in the knob itself. Oh, by the way, I can drag two at the same time because we have multi-touch now, right? You couldn't do this with a mouse area. Um, then there's also a tap handler in the knob itself. So if I simply tap the knob, that's like an extra gesture. I can do something unique with that. In this case, I'm just running a flash animation. So you, you can have new kinds of controls like that. And the rest of it's just kind of visual stuff for the slider. OK, so what have we seen as changes so far? Um, either a handler or an item can be the exclusive grabber. So far, I'm, and I mean before, an item would become the exclusive grabber just by not rejecting an event. So it accepted it, so it became the grabber. With handlers, it's more explicit. Um, any number of handlers can be passive grabbers. So on press, we don't usually want to uh, stop the propagation. We want to actually deliver to as many handlers as possible so that they can see the initial press and then they can become passive grabbers um, and monitor all the movements after that. We have this rule that if the number of touch points changes, we ignore the exclusive grab and start over with event delivery. So what this allows is, say on the map, I can drag with one finger. So at this point, since I'm actually dragging, the drag handler is active, it has the exclusive grab. I put down a second finger, well now the rule's changed. Um, we must be doing a pinch because there are two fingers. The drag handler isn't interested in handling two fingers. So we actually just give up the exclusive grab and start over with the event delivery because there's two fingers now, so it has a chance to take over. Um, we have these wrapper events, which I'll, I'll show the class diagram in a minute, but um, the mouse event has to be modeled kind of like a touch event. It has one point inside, whereas a touch event can have multiple points inside. 
Um, every pointer handler that we deliver to is going to receive the complete event, and that's what makes possible reacting to, to touch points that are outside the bounds. Because for items, so far it was actually hard coded in QQuick Window that when we deliver a touch event to an item, we only give it the touch points that are inside because we assume those are the only ones that it cares about. But then that made this sort of interaction impossible. So now we, we don't bother making a customized touch event, we just give it the whole thing. And it can decide for itself what it wants. Um, if a pointer handler accepts the event, it stops propagation, and it doesn't mean anything else. It doesn't imply a grab, it just stops propagation. You don't usually want to do that, because you want to let the rest of the pointer handlers see it as well. Um, and grabbing and ungrabbing are independent, so if you want to grab, you have to explicitly do that in a pointer handler. We're talking about C++ implementation of the pointer handler now. In QML, it's um, default behavior is probably what you want, of course. Um, so, yeah, an item had to grab in order to get updates, and this caused us a lot of grief or, you know, kind of determined the architecture of how mouse area had to do so much because, you know, if, if, there, if the first item that fails to ignore the event is always going to get the grab, then you pretty much want that one item to do everything because it doesn't give other items a chance. And then there was just this one detour or a workaround so that Flickable can, grab, can steal the grab it has, to do, it has to be a filter in order to do that. And then there's also queue object event filtering. You can always install an event filter and do whatever you want, right? That's another workaround. So we, we changed this with pointer handlers. We want to let the events propagate. Exclusive grabs shouldn't be quite so common. And we use passive grabs more. In the implementation, there's two uh, functions that you'll typically, virtuals that you'll need to override in a pointer handler if you do this in C++. There's the wants event point, which will be called for each point to ask whether it's interested or not. And typically, it's just going to check its bounds. That's the sort of default thing to do. And if once pointer event returns true, then there's a handle pointer event implementation, which will be called, which will do the real work. So now I'm going to show um, there's this new shape feature in 5.10. So I, created, I used path SVG to create these little sector shapes here. And then I have a patch on top of 5.10 which overrides the shape contains, because every QQuick item has this virtual contains method where it takes a point and it says, does it contain the point or not? So by default, item only checks rectangular bounds because that's the most efficient, <coughs> most efficient thing to do. So I changed it so that I can check whether it contains, whether the, um, the actual shape contains the point. So when I press with either the mouse or touch outside, it doesn't activate, inside it does. That's not in 5.10 yet, but we're, st we're still de debating whether which should be the default behavior because it's kind of a change. I mean, even a rectangle, if you make rounded corners, you can turn it into a circle, but it still reacts to the rectangular bounds, right? So it seems like we need to come up with a, with a solution for all of those cases to have more uh, shaped bounds or not. Um, okay, briefly, the event hierarchy. Why we have trouble with delivery is basically that there's no base class to handle for just the, for all the pointer events. And so you, you've got touch event, which has, it doesn't have a position, it has multiple points inside. Then all the rest of these, they have positions, except that we're not very consistent about the names and the types of those properties. They're positioned a lot of different ways, sometimes Q point, sometimes Q point F and so forth. Um, so we kind of think that maybe in Qt6, maybe we should re-architect the event hierarchy a little bit, but we can't do that before Qt6 which is why we had to create these wrapper things. And also there's a lot of overlap between, we've got native gesture event, we have wheel event, we have scroll event, and we have queue gesture event, and any of those could maybe be involved in a flick. So we need to maybe re-architect that a little bit as well. We're thinking about it, how to do that in Qt6. But in the meantime, we need something for Qt Quick, so we came up with this wrapper architecture. Where we have a Qt Quick pointer event, and it has API as if it's going to always have multiple points inside. But then there's a subclass for mouse event. It only happens to have one point inside. And for touch, you can have actually multiple points inside. And we've got all these properties, you know, pressure, rotation, and velocity, and all those kind of things. And every pointer event knows which device it came from. So these are Q objects, and we, d we did that in order to have properties accessible in QML for the rare cases when you actually receive an event in QML. And um, since they're Q objects, we actually reuse the instances so when a, when a release happens, we, we reset the pointer event and it forgets the original event. And when a new event comes in, we just assign it and it assigns all the properties. 
and then it's reused. So we have an event instance per device, basically. The handler hierarchy, which you don't have to care about yet because we, C++ API isn't there yet, but it will be. We've got the abstract base class pointer handler. We have a pointer device handler, which adds these properties to be more device specific if you care about which devices, which buttons are pressed and so forth. Then you've got a single handler, which only reacts to one point. That's most of the handlers. They all tend to inherit that because, you know, dragging, you, you only need one point to do that. Then we've got the multi-point handler, which has the minimum and maximum properties. So these are all abstract so far. And then the leaf classes, we've got the pinch handler is the only one that handles multiple points so far. Drag handler, tap handler. Point handler isn't actually in 5.10, but that's the one I'm using to move the sprite around the screen to keep track of my fingers. So there's a patch in progress for that. And yeah, just to show you, you really can press multiple buttons at the same time. I can hold those down. As long as I hold them down, I'm launching balloons and fighters to shoot down the balloons. <laughs> missiles, they're expensive, so I only want to do this untapped. When the tap happens, I launch one missile. <laughs> and the implementation over here is the button itself, so we've got a rectangle, a gradient, a tap handler inside. It emits a tap signal, and we have the alias to tell whether it's currently pressed. Point handler, this is the new one that's not in 5.10 yet, but it can be used just to move something around in response to the touch point moving, and that's done by doing a passive grab. So I create a point handler, and then I'm using the shape thing again to draw this cross. So instead of SVG, I just use a you know, start and a line and a move and a line, and it ends up drawing a cross. I also use, use it to show velocity, so that if I move really fast, this uh, gray line gets longer because it's got the components of the velocity to determine the, that line. So you can actually show that the velocity really works. And okay, so what's left for future versions? We need to finish making up our minds about what the passive grab really means because um, well, we're pretty sure it means that it should always get the updates no matter what, but the question is before or after the regular event delivery. If we, if we do it before regular delivery, then we're going to probably call it passive aggressive grab because <laughs> yeah, it's getting the events before anybody else. Um, the, point handler, the point handler isn't in 5.10, but we think we need it. Flicking, we're not quite sure how to handle that yet because we want to refactor flickable, so should we really just use drag handler or just flick something unique? And then we have to handle the scrolling and, and the Q scroll event and the Q wheel event somehow. We're not doing anything with those yet. We haven't done anything with hover yet either, by the way. If we don't go with the passive grab concept, then we would have to come up with some other way that the handler can just monitor the touch points without grabbing. Then maybe it would have to be a window API so you can actually subscribe or you know bind just properties in the window. We have to get ready to actually have the public C++ API so that we can do that later. Um, attached properties, one quick thing that's nice about them is being able to control them from outside a control. Like if a control has an attached property, then um, when you instantiate the control, it, it, let's say you want to change the behavior, um, you can actually make another key's attached property outside the control and then you can decide in your attached property whether to forward to the inner attached property. So you have kind of the ability to override behavior. And the, the JP, the guy who's implementing controls two, he thinks that that's a very important feature because in controls one, there was this tendency that, well, the, the button has a mouse area inside and you can't see the instance of it. So if you want to change behavior, you just pile another mouse area on top, which isn't very efficient. And um, so we think maybe we should actually use the attached properties as a way of manipulating handlers that are already there. And also to satisfy anybody who thinks it's nice to just be able to write, you know, mouse on pressed, do something instead of having to create an instance. But we're not sure about that yet. We're still debating it. And then there's this, um, well, I call them handlers. I call these things pointer handlers, but then it gets a little bit awkward to talk about a tap handler has an on tapped what do I call this? Is it a, a callback? We've always called these JavaScript blocks handlers so far. So we can say a tap handler has an untapped handler, which doesn't make sense. Maybe we should call these gesture um, recognizers instead, or something like that, instead of pointer handlers. So we're still debating that. This is why it's tech preview. It's incomplete, and we're not sure about the name, and we're not sure about a lot of things still. But 
we figured we have to get it out there because we've been talking about it for years and um, everybody needs the functionality and yeah. So please start using it, <laughs> see how you like it. Um, and then there's the, the whole native gestures approach to things. I mean, we can say that in Qt Quick we basically have distributed gesture recognition because we start with the assumption that you're going to get the raw touch events from the touch screen and we're going to deliver the events to the items and then the, the items, the leaf items are going to decide for themselves whether it's a gesture or not. But some operating systems don't work that way. Like the trackpad on Mac OS, for example, the, the way that it works best is to let the OS recognize the pinch gesture and then deliver what a Q native gesture event, which contains the pinch. We deliver that to all the items and then which item wants to, wants to handle the pinch. It would typically be the pinch area that's been implemented. But the delivery, again, is a separate path. And we probably need to handle those kind of events, the gesture events, the same as the pointer events, so that that delivery path can be unified and it has all the same features that you can accept and reject and grab and so forth. So we think that we might need to re-architect it a little bit to, meet, to be, because maybe in the future the touch events are going to be relatively rare. You're going to be getting the gesture events from either the OS or the QPA plugin or something like that when the gesture recognition is more centralized. Maybe that was a better approach. So we still have to think about that a little bit. So that's all I have. <laughs> I don't know if there's still time for questions, but... We have six minutes for questions. Okay. So we have six more minutes for questions. I'll come around with a microphone. This presentation's on GitHub, by the way. You want to see these, play with the examples, you can. Um, did you consider adding a declarative API for like um, refusing further tap events? Like uh, uh, you tap, where you have a window of 500 milliseconds where you don't grab that as a pressed or something like that. Well, you can disable it during that period. Use a timer or something, right? So yeah, the way of doing it now is using a timer. But yeah. if you ju could just have a property like 300 milliseconds and it ignores it in that interval should would be nice. Okay. More questions? Uh, the back. That might be a case for using the C++ API when it's there. You could add this feature. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in the events class you have the once uh, pointer event and the handle pointer event uh, uh -huh. methods, right? So I wonder why isn't the handle pointer event enough. So you, you save one virtual call and the, the subclass can just return if it doesn't want to handle it. Um, so what's the question? Why what? is it that way? Or? Why do we have both once event point and the handle pointer event? Well, basically it was just because this idea that QQuick window had hard coded that before. If an item contains the mouse press or if it contains any of the touch points, then it would assume that the item wants it. So I thought, well, instead of hard coding it, why don't we just ask the handler? So that's why we came up with this yes, sort of... but what I'm saying is that since it is a virtual call, you, uh, it, you have some overhead to call it, while just the handle pointer event could be enough. If it, it can return false, I mean, to mean that it doesn't want to handle it, and you save the first call. Yeah. Yeah, we could have done that. That might be more efficient, but... It, it also seems to work well with uh, with uh, inheritance hierarchy too, that the responsibility is distributed somewhat, that the base classes can decide whether, like this multiple, um, multi-point multi handler can decide for itself whether the number of points is within range, and, and that way you don't have to do this in a subclass, in the pinch handler. So that's one reason. Uh, question about Funky hardware. Is it is this architecture going to make it easier to add support for new hardware, like for example, not just think about mouse and touch, but rather things like various pens, digitizers, you know, Microsoft dial, whatever? Because it starts to get exotic and, and fitting those into touch or mouse is, is very tricky. We haven't really thought about that. Mostly it's just the Wacom tablets or gesture devices, anything that generates a point with a position type of thing, but yeah, those other events are typically different, right? 
So one more question and any more questions here? So I don't see any hands going up. So thank you, Sean, for your presentation. That's very interesting. <laughs>